Happy Halloween! You can get 36 bucks off an annual subscription to Blaze TV. It's got nothing to do with, uh, honestly, Halloween, but you can get it anyway. Uh, use the code Stu Plus. Oh, yeah, it's on the mug. Stu Plus. I would use the actual PLUS, though, if you want to get the 36 bucks off. BlazeTV.com slash Stu is the place to go to get that. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, like the videos, hit the bell for reminders. We're probably going to be doing some uh, debate coverage next week, which is always a lot of fun. Uh, so check that out. Uh, and if you do the little bell, you'll know when we go live with extra coverage. We're going to be doing that all through election season. Chuck Holton is going to join us here in a little bit from the West Bank uh, to talk about all the latest in Israel. Speaking of Israel, TikTok is screwing up our view of the situation in a pretty significant way. I'll tell you how. Uh, but we start by doing the State of the Race 2024 Part 6. Now, it's Halloween. What was Halloween Part 6? Uh, that, was, that was the one with Paul Rudd in it, I think. Yes, Paul, a very young Paul Rudd uh, threatened by Michael Myers in Halloween 6. I'm sure, it, I mean, I can't remember, honestly, which, there's like a few I can remember. Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, one of the greatest movies of all time. Halloween 6, eh, I don't really remember it all that much, but I'm sure Paul really does. Um, I want to kind of go through where we are in this race, because this is one of the strangest presidential races we've ever been through. I, it's almost impossible to actually comprehend what's going on right now. Let me give you a very weird piece of this puzzle. Here's Gavin Newsom running over a Chinese child. Oh, now he's got the background. We're going this way. Uh -oh. oh, just obliterates a Chinese kid. Oh, now you might say, wait a minute, Gavin Newsom isn't running for president. Well, what the hell is he doing in China? Now, what they say, I guess, is. Here's what it, uh, what Governor Newsom's trip to China accomplished. This is not from a news organization, because obviously a real news organization, it, the body of the article would just say nothing. But what it does here, this is from his actual office, and it's blah, 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 climate change, blah, 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 talking to President Xi. But again, this is something a presidential candidate might do. Why is the governor of California doing it? It's, it's weird. It's, he's doing everything you would do to run for president of the United States without actually running for president in the United States. And maybe he's just setting himself up in case Joe Biden gets a, a really bad cold one day and things go the wrong direction. Understandable uh, that he might be concerned about such things. But we have, think of this race. You have Gavin Newsom, the governor of a state, a major state with a high profile, debating another governor who is running for president, but actually not even in first place. You, they're going at each other, even though, Gavin Newsom isn't actually running for president. Then you have the president in the United States who's like 150 years old and can't get through a sentence. We now have a guy from a, whose dad owned a gelato company. By the way, delicious. Talenti, delicious. Uh, that, my wife buys it all the time. That company, that guy from that company who's a congressman you've never heard of, is also running for president against Joe Biden. Did you even know that was happening? Joe Biden knows uh, very, very, he's got a lot of money, and they're a little scared of uh, this guy from Minnesota. Then you have on the Republican side, Donald Trump, who's a zillion miles ahead of everybody. When you have other candidates in the race, a bunch of them, some of them you've never heard of before. Others are really prominent. However, they can't seem to make a real dent in what Donald Trump is doing. And this all comes to the end of the story where we don't even know if Donald Trump's going to be in jail or not. Uh, what the hell is going on? Donald Trump, who might be in prison at any moment, if you believe the deep state is uh, not, a, not a, a good group of people, they may succeed in their mission to go after Donald Trump. It's clearly what they're trying to do. And if they do succeed, Donald Trump might just win the election from, from jail. Would you be surprised at all at this point? It is very, very weird, I will tell you that. Now, we've got a couple polls to go through. And uh, if you don't like polls, well, you know what, you don't have... I'll tell you what they say. You can believe them. You cannot believe them. But let me give you at least a picture of what's going on uh, in Iowa. Now, Iowa, this is, I mean, look, this, this is kind of narrowed. And we bash this process all the time. I make fun of it every single time it happens. But in reality, I think this primary process has worked pretty well so far. I, I mean, you, you started off at the beginning. There were seven people on stage. There might have been eight, nine, or ten. They were very close to having as many as ten on stage. Wound up being seven in the first debate. Wound up being six in the next debate. And it looks like this next one's going to have four people in it. Um, and is that 
that big of a deal? Is that that bad? I mean, that seems like a good, I mean, it would be nice if Donald Trump was in it, but four or five is not a bad number for this next debate uh, coming up uh, next week. Uh, by the way, um, we'll have the coverage, as I mentioned, here on the show. Uh, uh, after on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Judas America, I'll be doing um, a segment, uh, uh, the show with Megan Kelly next week, going over all of this as it happens. Going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you join us. Um, there is a line here, and I think the line is working pretty well, which is if you can't make the debate stage, get out, right? It's okay that you joined it. Like Mike Pence had an on-paper argument to be in this race. Former vice president of the United States. He wants to be in the race. He wants to run for president. Gets to run for president. He's got the kind of like master's green jacket, as we mentioned yesterday. You go in there, you kind of have a sensible argument to be in the race. If you can't make the debate stage, that argument goes away. Right. It shouldn't be that hard. I mean, you got to get four percent in the polls or something like that. It's not that big of a deal. You should be able to do that. Pence couldn't do it. Pence dropped out. Um, that is kind of how this works. There's other candidates that might be thinking the same thing coming soon. And I will say we've gone through this for a while. It seemed really distant. But the first caucus, the Iowa caucus, is in basically two months. It's in two and a half months, basically, from right now. Two and a half months, not that far. And remember, there's a big chunk of time that's going to be eaten up by the holidays where people are not really going to be paying attention. So if you're going to make your move, now's the time to do it. Donald Trump builds a big lead as Nikki Haley pulls even with Ron DeSantis in the Iowa poll. This is a Selzer poll. And this is, you know, if you talk to, you know, mainstream polling experts, they'll say that she does the best polling of Iowa, certainly, but also is one of the most respected pollsters in America. Uh, she's not always right. Polls aren't always right. We talk about this every single time there's an election and no one listens to me when I say it. But polls give you a general idea about what is going to occur. It does not give you the exact amount. So if you see a poll that says 50 to 48 and you're like, oh, well, Donald Trump's winning by two. He's going to win by two. That's not the right way to look at a poll. The right way to look at that poll is it's close. That's what you can get from that poll. You can't get who's going to win. You're going to get it's close. Now, 14 months in advance, you're probably not even going to get that. But two and a half months away from a primary, you're going to learn a little bit about this. Now, uh, you know, Steve Dace has been on the show. He'd explain this to you. He knows Iowa and uh, the on the ground stuff better than anybody. And like Iowa's a little bit different than some of these other states. The caucus process is a lot about ground game. It's a lot about who shows up on the day and who can be convinced uh, into a particular candidate as opposed to another. It's you know, it's a totally different world, the caucuses. We'll get into the details of it as we get closer. But let me give you the poll of what Iowa looks like right now. This does not tell the whole story, but it, there are some interesting things you can take from it. Uh, first place, of course, Donald Trump. He's at 43 percent in this poll. Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley tied at 16 percent. This is sort of the big headline. Everyone knows Donald Trump is going to be ahead in these polls. But the fact that Haley has pulled even with DeSantis is very good news for the Nikki Haley campaign. Um, she has a little bit of momentum. And one of the things you've noticed since the debates where people liked her performance, i got to say, I didn't particularly like her performance that much. I don't come into this as a Nikki Haley hater. Uh, she's, you know, a Republican. Some of the views that she has, I don't love. Some of them I really do. Some of the things about Nikki Haley I really like. I thought she was a pretty good governor of South Carolina when she was there. All that being said, I didn't think her, her debate performances were all that strong. I don't disagree. I don't agree with a lot of people in that. A lot of people really did like her performances, and it has helped her. She's, she's risen up. What's interesting about this poll is this is the first real movement you've seen from Haley in Iowa. We saw a lot of movement uh, from Haley in New Hampshire, and it's clearly South Carolina, which we have another update on that poll coming up here in a second. Um, you saw movement from these other states. You didn't really see it in Iowa. Iowa has a more religious um, uh, group of voters there. They didn't really embrace uh, Haley. This is the first good sign for Haley in Iowa of any real note. Behind that is Tim Scott. Scott is investing a lot of resources in Iowa and just really not connecting. He's at 7%. Vivek uh, Ramaswamy and Chris Christie at 4%. Douglas Bergamentum at 3%. Asa Hutchinson at 1%. Ryan Binkley, who's not even on our chart, I don't think. He's at 0%. And uh, that's, that's it. Of course, you know, one of the things that you could say for Haley and the reason why this is a good poll for her is the news cycle has kind of broken her way here over the past couple of weeks. She obviously was an ambassador to the UN. Uh, she has a decent amount of expertise on the world stage. And uh, 
central to her argument is a hawkish uh, national defense. That argument, which is not really being brought by either tr uh, Trump or uh, DeSantis in the same way, uh, is something that you did see from people like Pence before he dropped out and, and Tim Scott as well. Um, that is working right now. Will that be a long-term win? Uh, you know, if we were to get attacked by terrorists, uh, you'd say, okay, well, probably national defense is going to be the big focus. Uh, will, that, will that hold all the way for the next couple of months? I don't know. We were lost interest in Ukraine pretty quickly. I don't know if that's going to happen in, in uh, Israel. We will, we will see on that one. Let me give you a couple of other details from the poll. Nearly half of caucus goers who picked Trump as their first choice are extremely enthusiastic about him. This is really good news if you happen to be uh, Donald Trump. Uh, 87 percent of his voters are either extremely enthusiastic or very enthusiastic. Only 65 percent for Ron DeSantis and uh, about 75 percent, actually a better number for Nikki Haley than uh, DeSantis on that, which is is promising. So in that argument, you could say, okay, well, maybe Nikki Haley's 16% is a little bit better than Ron DeSantis' 16%. You can make that argument. I'm going to tell you the opposite argument here in a second. I think it's the right one, but we'll get to that here in just a second. Donald Trump um, is the first choice of 43%, second choice of 12%, and actively considering uh, another 12%. That gets him to 67%. This is your basically the window of voters. And this is why I would argue Ron DeSantis's 16% is actually a little bit better than uh, Nikki Haley's 16. Why? Well, he has about the same amount of people, 67% act actively considering him. Um, both Trump and DeSantis tied in that measure. Uh, Nikki Haley only at 54%, Tim Scott at 49%, Vivek way back at 32%, Doug Bergamentum, at 19%, notably beating Chris Christie, by the way, at 16%, Asa Hutchinson only nine, and Ryan Binkley only six. The reason why you know that's important is you want to have those people who you could actually get. The problem with the Haley coalition here, particularly in Iowa, but I would argue uh, across the Republican electorate as well, Haley's voters are largely made up of people who are anti-Trump, right? People who don't like Trump, who would not vote for Trump. That's a good chunk of the electorate. I, you know, I think you're probably around 30% of the Republican electorate. It's just like, I'm not considering Trump, I want somebody else. That's a good chunk. The question is, do you max out at 30% if that's all you can get? Ron DeSantis is pulling from both. Ron DeSantis is saying, some people are, who just don't like Trump are going to DeSantis, but a lot of people who do like Trump are also going to DeSantis. Now, they do seem to see DeSantis as their second choice. Many people are looking at him and saying, I like Trump, he's my number one, but DeSantis is my number two. If the legal troubles hit Trump in a certain way, this could really benefit DeSantis. DeSantis seems to have a possibility of a winning coalition built into his numbers, where Haley seems to have less of a possibility of that. She'll have to win almost every single person who's, who's uh, considering her to get over the hump, and that's not easy to do. Um, by the way, if you're wondering about the debates, they asked a question about it. Uh, most, likely Republic, uh, most likely Republican caucus goers don't care if Donald Trump participates in the debates. 57% said it doesn't matter. Um, about 42% says he, he should at least participate in one of them uh, before the caucus. I would like to see it, of course. I've been very clear on that. I, you know, look, it, Donald Trump doesn't debate. I mean, that's the, maybe the time he's most entertaining. We, we, we want to see that. And it's important to the American people and the Republican voters, I think. Um, let's go over to South Carolina here for a second. South Carolina, the Trump, again, way ahead. Haley, though, in South Carolina, as you might expect, is a strong second. 53% say Trump is their first choice. 22% say Nikki Haley. 11% say Ron DeSantis. This is not going to be a good DeSantis state, especially if there's two candidates from South Carolina running against him. Tim Scott only at 6% in his home state. Uh, again, I'd argue maybe it's time to go for Tim Scott. Many of the demographic and ideological divides present at the national level hold in the state as well. Trump leads Haley by 50 among likely voters without a college degree, 66 to 16, and by 40 among Republicans uh, generally, 59 to 19. By contrast, Trump and Haley are tied among college graduates, 32 percent each, and see similar levels of support among independents who say they're likely to vote in the GOP primary, 38-34 
Trump. So let's do a little update of our big board here. Uh, we have a five tier board and let me this is you know, a bunch of candidates who could fit in these. You want to be tier one. Uh, that's the best tier to be in. You're a top notch candidate. You're the favorite in this race. Tier five, you basically have no chance of winning this race. Less than 0.1 percent chance. Um, so let's look at these. T tier five. Well, we'll go through some of the names we haven't updated in a while. Mayor Suarez. If you missed this one, he is gone. No longer running. He is dropped out. Will Hurd. He is gone. No longer running. He is dropped out. You may have missed this one. I did. Actually, Larry Elder, the talk show host, about uh, four or five days ago, wound up dropping out. He got screwed out of that first debate and really just never had a chance uh, to catch any momentum at all after that. Um, and, of course, Mike Pence has also dropped out. So you got four people that were on our list before uh, all back in Tier 5 and have dropped out. Uh, a couple people who are in the, and this is, this is not good for your campaign. I should point this out. If you're in the same tier as the people who are no longer running, not good. Asa Hutchinson is in tier five. Uh, not good. And of course, also in tier five, we love him. You love him. Doug Bergamania. He is also in tier five. Uh, really just no path for Doug. He's not going to make this next debate. Hutchinson didn't make the last debate. Doug squeaked onto the stage, but will not make the next debate. Okay, Tim, uh, I was going to say Tim Four. Uh, Tim Scott's the only one in tier four, actually. Tim Scott just, again, has not caught fire. He does have money. He's investing a lot of it into Iowa. He is seeing almost no movement there. Again, this is a similar thing to Mike Pence. Tim Scott's a relatively well-known uh, senator. He has an argument to be in this race. It's not Asa Hutchinson. No one knows who he is. He never had a chance. There's a reason for, for Tim Scott to get into this race. It just hasn't worked. You know, maybe it'll work next time. Maybe he'll come back again. Who knows? Maybe he'll be able to solve the problems with his campaign. It hasn't happened. So Tim Scott down at, uh, you know, at uh, tier four, I mean, it's less than a 1%, you know, chance is how we were defining that before. Next up is uh, tier three. And then we lead that off with Vivek Ramaswamy. Ramaswamy's had an interesting journey here. He came on the scene strong. We, we know, he, uh, you know he's good on the air. We've had him on the show before. He's a good speaker. He's not an idiot. A lot of people are like, oh, he's so stupid. He's not stupid. He is, I mean, there are times it looks like he's a little bit in deep water uh, from time to time. And he's, some of the decisions he's made recently, like, for example, uh, going on the Alex Jones podcast and then bringing Alex Jones on his podcast, I, I don't know what he's going for there. Seems like he's kind of settled into this, um, people like to say he's a Trump surrogate. He doesn't say a lot of things that would that would argue with that position at this point. Um, he may be angling for something else at this point, but he's in a tier three along with Chris Christie. Now, you might say, Christie, wait, Christie's ahead of Scott? Um, yeah, I mean, and the reason why I would say that is at least he has one strong state. I mean, Scott really doesn't have any strong states. Uh, Ramaswamy doesn't either, but he's a little bit higher generally in the polls uh, than um, uh, uh, Tim Scott. Christie is so showing somewhat solidly in New Hampshire, and his showing in New Hampshire might be enough for him to stake around for a while, though I think there's a real possibility that in the coming, you know, maybe before Christmas, he drops out and uh, try, probably endorses Nikki Haley, It would be my, uh, my, my guess. Uh, in Tier 2, we have two candidates, Ron DeSantis who, of course, has been the second-place candidate basically the entire time, and I would still consider him the second-place candidate, although coming up on his heels, as we mentioned, Nikki Haley. Now, Haley has been the one breakout from this lower field. And the reason why we arranged it in tiers at the beginning was to, to note this, that there is a chance that some of these candidates that don't look like they have an opportunity could rise up. I think Haley was a tier, tier three or tier four candidate at the beginning, has made a rise, and is now in the game. Look, if you have a three-person race, and you're one of those people, especially when one of the people might be in prison later on. It's not the worst place to be. And Haley, I think, is going to stick around for a while. Of course, uh, the number one is, is absolutely no surprise whatsoever. Uh, Doug Burgum. No, uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the uh, tier one, only tier one candidate. He's the only one that can be considered tier one. I honestly considered making Trump tier one and putting no one in tier two and putting DeSantis and Haley in tier three because there's such a gap there. But I think if you look at the state by state data, you get a little more optimistic for either Haley or DeSantis. Um, I want to, uh, there's so much we can go on and we have so much more to cover when it comes to the elections, but I want to take a break. I want to go over to the, another big story of the day. Of course, what's going on in Israel? The ground and Invasion is gearing up. It has started at some level. We're going to talk to Chuck Holton live from the West Bank here in just a second.
Let me tell you about Liver Health Formula. They already helped more than 2.6 million people with their products. Maybe you're one of them. It's not surprising that Liver Health Formula is a popular product because, you know, people want their livers to be healthy. That's kind of a basic function. You really need them. If you were to add up all the residents of Arizona, Virginia, Florida, and Texas, you still would not get to the 100 million Americans that have a sluggish, fatty liver, and that makes people gain weight and experience fatigue. If you're suffering from low energy, brain fog, or explain, uh, unexplained extra flab, my flab has always been very well explained. It's too much Taco Bell. That's how I get it, but I don't know how you're getting it. You should try Liver Health Formula if you want to solve some of these problems. It's an all-natural supplement packed with clinically proven botanicals to help you recharge and protect your liver. It has thousands of positive reviews on Amazon. On uh, Blaze TV, of course, you can get the best offer they have on the entire Internet. That's true. With your order, you get a free bottle of blood sugar formula. In total, you're getting a 64% discount, which is pretty big. Uh, head over to, de- uh, to the page getliverhelp.com. Get the special offer going on now. Remember, we can't save America. America if we don't save ourselves. Go to getliverhelp.com slash stew. Getliverhelp.com slash stew. It's liver health formula. I want to bring in Chuck Holton. He's a war correspondent and host of the Hot Zone podcast, which you can subscribe to wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. He's been doing some great coverage for CBN as well, live from Israel. Uh, Chuck, thanks so much for joining us. And you're in the West Bank right now? Sure thanks, Stu. I am. It's interesting just watching you and listening. You know, I can hear crickets, and it's like it's so. In- it sounds so serene and calm there. And I know this is how war mm-hmm. is, but not too far away, chaos reigns. Can you give us a sense of what it's like there right now? That's right. Well, uh, so you've got about five hundred thousand Jews who live in what they call Judea and Samaria, the biblical land of Judea and Samaria. This is actually Mount blessing that I'm on uh, from the Bible. And uh, just across over that way is the the mountain of cursing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these settlers are spread out within about 200 different settlements throughout the Judea and Samaria, surrounded by about 2 million Palestinian Arabs. And Right now, uh, the tensions are very, very high, obviously, between the the Arab population or the Muslim populations specifically and the Jewish population uh, that is living up here and has been for decades. Uh, They talk about what happened on October 7th down in Gaza, and they say, told me today many times, look, on October 7th, the Hamas terrorists had to break through a gigantic wall with lots of high tech thing, you know, uh, surveillance stuff on it, and come in order to come in and massacre the people in the kibbutzim around the southern part of, of Israel. Here, we're surrounded by two million angry Arabs, some some of whom are angry at least, uh, Arabs, and we don't have a fence, we don't have a wall, we don't have anything. And not only that, they're not very well armed up here, and so they they're worried that there could be a repeat of October 7th here, specifically because the leadership of the Palestinian Authority, which administers much of the West Bank, has been literally calling for a repeat of October 7th, specifically here in the Jewish settlements in the West Bank. It's really sh- shocking to think about it. And, and this is part of the big calculation of what's going on right now in, in you know what they refer to as Gaza, where you have a situation that if you have a massive operation on that side, you leave open uh, you know, other borders and other areas where something like this could happen and you might not be able to respond quickly to it. Uh, what's the calculation here? How do, they, how do they defend every single side? Well, this was what the Jews would call the, the fourth front of this war because they've got, of course, the front uh, along the border with Gaza, but they also have the second front in uh, the north with Lebanon and Hezbollah. The third front would be Syria and the Syrian army or the militias over there, and this is what they would call the fourth front. Uh, there are some National Guard troops or, or uh, reservists that are stationed here, especially here on this mountaintop where I'm standing, and they are, you have to understand, the Israeli military has called up so many people that their military is now larger than the American military uh, with a much, much smaller wow. base to draw from. 
They have about uh, over 500,000 troops under arms now, and the United States only has 480,000 under under arms at any given time. Uh, now, that doesn't count the reservists and all the things that, that the United States could call up, but that's just it. The Israelis have called up all of their reserves, and they had 160% respond, meaning there are a lot more people that volunteered to come and serve their country, so much so that they're having a hard time finding even uniforms for everybody. And so this particular place, or this the, these settlements in the West Bank, are under a particular threat because there are just so many very well-armed uh, Muslims that are surrounding them, and there just aren't enough troops to cover everything uh, in the middle of the country. Now, uh, the, the I drove through a an Arab settlement on my way here, and everything is shut down. It's a ghost town, and the IDF has come through and blocked every road uh, leading up to Main Street so that no IEDs can no no VBIDs can come through and kill people who are driving through there because that happens. And in uh, matter of fact, the people I'm with here said that in February, two of the people from this settlement were murdered in that same village that I just drove through as they were just driving through there. They were just shot by somebody that was angry, but there are a lot more angry people now. And in Ramallah, uh, just south of here, uh, earlier today, there was a massive protest, uh, pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas protest. You're seeing the, that kind of thing in Nablus, which is just right over this way. I can see the outskirts of Nablus from where I'm standing. So the bottom line is, this is a major threat and it's not getting a lot of press because nothing's blowing up here just yet. The one thing that is uh, that they don't have here is rockets coming in because the rockets from Gaza can't reach and they haven't started firing rockets this far south from the north. So the, they only have to worry about snipers, RPGs, and VBIDs, which, you know, if you ask me, that's enough to worry about. <laughs> yes, it sure is. Um, let's, let's talk about what Israel is doing in, in Gaza right now. You know, it's, it's like, you know, you, you, if you've never been in a war correspondent, you've never been in the military, you have no sense of what these battles are really like. You've seen it in the movies, maybe you played some video games. You, know, you, you drag your troops onto the other troops and they battle it out on the screen and that's kind of your experience of war. It, the idea of getting rid of Hamas is obviously something that needs to be done, but to actually accomplish it, it's incredibly difficult. What are they looking at as they start to move into Gaza? Well, it is incredibly difficult. That's one of the reasons why they spent three weeks pounding uh, northern Gaza to dust before they pushed in there. Uh, urban combat is the most difficult form of combat there is. And it, unless you've done it, it's hard to even describe. I can promise you that anybody who has done it doesn't want to ever do it again. Uh, that goes pretty generally for any kind of actual war, but specifically urban combat. That's be simply because of geometry. There are so many angles in an urban environment from which you can be shot. And it's very, very hard to cover all those angles all the time. So again, if you can bomb those buildings and flatten most of them before you get in there, you're reducing the number of angles from which you can be shot. But it also opens up a whole lot of difficulty in just mobility, moving around. And if you don't have the ability to just move around wherever you want to go, it's easily easy to get funneled into an ambush or hit with an IED or something like that. So one of the things that we've seen as we've been down on the Gaza border is we've watched these D12 cat bulldozers that are have cages over them. They're anti-RPG cages and they're all armored up. And they go in first, even ahead of the tanks, in order to clear a path so that the tanks can go through. That serves the purpose of opening up that, uh, that area because again, those roads are all choked with debris now. Uh, it draws fire and it's really hard to hurt a D12 cat. And it gives the, the tanks, it, a safe passage through there as well as the infantry. So uh, this is a massive combined arms operation. You just imagine how many moving parts you're talking about in there with aviation support and artillery support. And uh, you know you have all these different moving parts as far as armor and infantry and things like that. This is going to be very, very difficult. And then you add in 300 miles of tunnels that they've got to clear underneath Gaza. and 
<coughs> excuse me, you're in for one heck of a fight. Yeah, no, it's true. And the tunnels, especially, like, it's it's something, if there's going to be anything more difficult than the urban warfare, it might be going into a series of uh, tunnels that m extend 300 miles. Some of these tunnels uh, reported something like six and seven stories deep, uh, ventilation down there. I mean, uh, they seem incredibly intense. They don't actually have full maps of these things, of course. The, many of these, they don't even know where they're going. And they also have to deal with the fact that there's probably going to be a bunch of prisoners, maybe Americans, Israelis, uh, Thai prisoners, all there down there being held in these tunnels. I mean, it seems incomprehensible to try to deal with this. Is there a plan? Is there a way to do it? Well, there's not an easy way to do it. As you said, uh, it, they can't just flood them with seawater or gas in the, put pump gas in there and kill everybody <clears throat> because, like you say, there could be hostages down there. And so they have specialized sapper units. I've interviewed some of the guys from those units, and they have been training for a long time to find and fix and finish people inside those tunnels. They have some as to uh, heretofore unproven or untried technologies that they're employing now mm -hmm. inside those tunnels. One of the, them that they told us about was what the, something they call a sponge bomb, which is essentially like a gigantic can of great stuff that you'd buy at Home Depot and seal your windows up with. And you know how nasty that stuff is. It just expands and get, gets all over everything. Well, they throw one of these down one of those tunnels and it explodes and fills that tunnel from floor to ceiling and seals it off. So nobody's wow. getting through there. So then they can go to another entrance and they can clear toward that entrance and know that nobody's going to come through, you know, coming that way. So... They also have, I'm sure, some kind of drone technology, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, somebody is going to have to go in there and walk through those tunnels and clear each room and find whatever's in there and, and either kill the bad guys or rescue the good guys. And that is going to take time. It's going to take a very methodical, very intentional, slow process to get that done. Uh, Chuck, last one for you here, and I appreciate you doing this all the way from uh, from Israel, and, and, I, and I know you're struggling with your voice there, so I appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this. Um, last one is basically like, what does this look like at the end? It, it, let's just say this is successful. They go in, they're able to kill a bunch of the Hamas leadership um, and, and get rid of their infrastructure. That's obviously going to be a benefit, but it doesn't solve the situation long term. I, I mean, you know, a pessimist looks at the polls of Palestinians and does not see a long term path for them living side by side. There's talk of a demilitarized zone. There's talk about ex extending the security in some way. What does this look like at the end? Is, is there a way for Israel to feel as safe as they should? Benjamin Netanyahu gave a speech last night in which he sort of laid out what the objectives of this operation are. And if I could, I'll just boil it all down. Essentially what he said was, we are going to come in and reboot Gaza. We're just gonna wipe it clean. Mm. And then we're gonna leave. And you guys can rebuild your government any way you want. Doesn't have to be a Jeffersonian democracy, we don't care. But the minute you become a threat to us again, we will turn around and come in there and reboot your country for you once more. And we'll keep doing that as many times as it takes until you guys learn that we're not playing anymore. And uh, so that's my paraphrase of his whole speech. But uh, he was very forceful and uh, laid it out and incidentally sort of disregarded a lot of the advice that the United States has been trying to give him, the three-star general who's looking over his shoulder in the bunker there uh, and basically trying to uh, keep him from going all the way and actually finishing the job. Essentially what they're trying to do is make it impossible for Israel to actually make a difference down there. And you know, all these calls for a ceasefire, what everybody here in, in Israel has been saying, hearing these calls for a ceasefire, is that we had a ceasefire on October 6th. Mm. And Hamas finished that one. So that's, that's where we are and uh, Israel is, their blood is up. They're not in the mood to talk about anything but 
the absolute eradication of Hamas and anybody else who gets in their way. Now, one of the crazy things I just want to mention here in the West Bank is that as, as I look off of this hilltop here on Mount Blessing and look in just about any direction, there's a an Arab settlement right there, as close as they can possibly get. Some of them, uh, just over this way, they're actually building Arab houses on Israeli, uh, they call it Zone C land, in uh, in contravention of the Oslo Accords, but they're they're building houses right up to the line to the guard post. This is a real problem, and and one of the things I noticed as I scanned those villages with the binoculars today is that most of those houses they're building are empty. And I said, well, why is it a ghost town over there? There's nobody in those houses. And they said they're not building them to live in. They're just building them so that we can't build them, build build any houses on the land that was apportioned to us through the Oslo Accords. And uh, so I said, well, that sounds very expensive. I mean, how, how, where are they getting the money for this? And they said, that's an interesting question because the Biden administration has given the Palestinian Authority $2 billion and since, since he came to power and that they're using a lot of the American taxpayer money to do that. And this is something that is just not being reported. I'm working on that more and hope to get that story out over the next couple of days. Well, your reporting has been fantastic uh, from, from there. I've been watching it on CBN uh, pretty much every night, and it's really, uh, really impressive. And I thank you for, so much for being there and telling these stories because people need to know what's going on. It's Chuck Holton. He's the host of thank the Hot you. Zone podcast. Uh, be sure to subscribe today if you haven't already. Check it out on YouTube and check out his updates as well, of course, uh, over at CBN. Chuck, thanks so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Joe. Well, if you're going to buy, uh, build a new home, um, I would not recommend building it on land that you're not supposed to from, an, uh, from the Oslo Accords. That's not the way you want to build uh, your uh, particular settlement, as we just learned. Um, but if you're just buying or selling a home in, in a nice old calm America where nothing ever goes wrong, uh, you need to have the right real estate agent. And if you want to find the best real estate agent in your area, our own Glenn Beck started a company that's going to help you do just that. It's called realestateagentsitrust.com. It pairs you up with the best real estate agents, both in the area you're moving from and the area you're moving to. Even if you're in the same town, you want to have the best agent uh, on, the, on both sides of that transaction. These are some of the top sellers in the business. They know the best practices to get you the best price for your home and to get the best price on your new home. Best of all, they are great people. They're lots, lots of times listeners to this show or the radio show or something else on The Blaze. They can relate to you. You're usually right in line with the way you think, and, and that's what I want. I want someone who's going to be, I'm going to be able to trust. That's, that's what it is, realestateagentsitrust.com, realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. It's a free service to you, realestateagentsitrust.com. YouTube has about 1.5 million NFL Sunday ticket subscribers. Um, and what does that mean? You may be like, oh, that's a great number. Congratulations to YouTube. Uh, they're going to lose $1.2 billion this season off of it. <laughs> now, look, DirecTV always lost money off of the NFL package, too. It's kind of a loss leader, right? Like you, the only reason I am a subscriber to YouTube TV is because they have the NFL Sunday ticket. And I must see the Eagles, who, by the way, I don't know if you know this, are the best team in the NFL right now. I just thought I'd point that out. Um, but uh, it is one of those things that you kind of have to have if you're a big NFL fan. You're going to go wherever you have to go uh, to get it. And so they, a lot of people are going over there and subscribing to the full YouTube TV service as well. Um, but it's not as high as I think they want it. Only about 20% of people are doing it. So about 80% of people are just getting the NFL Sunday ticket and sticking with whatever they had before. Otherwise, that's not a great thing. So let's see if that improves for them. It's a branding issue, I guess, you know? I don't know. YouTube TV, it's confusing. You got YouTube, you got YouTube TV. People don't under even understand what the services are. Uh, you have to kind of educate people what they are. The same thing happened with the crispy chicken sandwich at McDonald's. Now, <clears throat> you might say to yourself, I know what the crispy chicken sandwich is. It's a crispy chicken sandwich. True. But what if I were to not tell you you were about to eat a crispy chicken sandwich? What if I were to tell you you were going to eat a McCrispy? Some genius said, we should just call it the McCrispy. They did that, and it's made them now a billion-dollar brand. 
The McCrispy is a billion dollar brand after the name change, which is fascinating. And sometimes when you change things and you can improve them a little bit, that's a really good thing. Snow White is a good example of this. There's the big backlash on the Snow, new Snow White movie with the, you know, the, 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 the actress, whatever her name is, Rachel, whatever, saying, hey, I don't like the old Snow White story. I'm a perfect person to put in the role of Snow White. And they had like dwarves that weren't dwarves. They were like full sized people and like they were like, I don't know, transgendered or something. Do you remember the picture that got leaked? This is what it looked like. Uh, only one dwarf. It's Snow White and the one dwarf and the six other people. Well, uh, uh, they're like, um, we've heard the backlash and we're changing the entire movie. This is what they just released now, which is blatantly CGI uh, elves apparently going to now be. Uh, they're redoing the whole movie and have delayed it an entire year. So. Maybe you'll get the Snow White that you really want. Let me tell you about Jace Daily. They are the company that brought you the Jace case. Uh, and this Jace Daily is a prescription su uh, supply service that will allow you to get not just one month of whatever medication you need, but like a 12-month backup uh, of all your prescription medications in case of emergency. This is going to cover well, a lot of medications, not every single one. But if you have uh, you know issues that you uh, have with cholesterol or diabetes, heart health, blood pressure, mental health, Jace is working to expand their medical offerings. They've even added a number of add-on options for the Jace case. This is a great company. They want to keep you make make sure you have the medication that you need if in case something goes down with the supply chain, or maybe you're just traveling, or maybe you're just lazy and don't want to go to the pharmacy all the time, like me. Uh, your order is reviewed by a certified healthcare professional and delivered right to your door. It's very easy. It's the Jace case and Jace daily from jacemedical.com. Jacemedical.com. Enter the code Stu at checkout for a discount on your order. The promo code is Stu at jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E medical.com. Well, as a parent, uh, you know that the most important thing you can do is turn your child's brain over to the Chinese Communist Party. And you do that, of course, through TikTok. It's a great, great plan, and if you're not executing it right now, what are you doing as a mom or a dad? Now, one thing that's interesting is a lot of kids are understanding the world, and also a lot of adults are understanding the world, by the dumb posts they see on TikTok. And you're going to be surprised to hear that the Chinese Communist Party is selecting a certain view of the Israel-Palestine conflict. I know, it's just really shocking. Here's look, look at these numbers, though. On the uh, week of October 16th to the 23rd, there were um, about 123,000 stand with Palestine posts and only 8,000 stand with Israel. But they got about the same viewership. Actually, Israel was a little bit more. The Chinese Communist Party didn't like that. So they've changed a little bit. Now, with about the same split in posts, um, stand with Palestine has 285 million views and st stand with Israel only 64 million. So it went from totally even to four times the views for the Palestinian posts. Uh, this is uh, not exactly surprising, but again, what could possibly go wrong by turning over all of our brains to the Chinese Communist Party? Here's an idea. Maybe that was a bad plan. I'm just throwing that out there. Why, look at that mug you have, Stu. Where did you get it? Well, studiosmerch.com, but that's not, what, it's not about the mug. It's about the subscription to Blaze TV. Go to blazetv.com slash Stu. You get 36 bucks off your annual subscription. That money you save, you can go and buy merch. Uh, why not do that? Uh, the code is Stu Plus. Stu Plus, S-T-U-P-L-U-S, technically. Stu Plus at blazetv.com slash Stu. You get 36 bucks off your subscription. This is the biggest savings they've offered in quite some time. So jump on it. 36 bucks off, blazetv.com slash Stu. Code is Stu Plus.